We're live. Hello, it's Bill, the knee pain guru. Welcome to the Dr. Beck show. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Bill. <laughs> How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. Good. Cold here. We uh, skipped fall, went straight into winter. This is Monty Python stuff. Summer's yeah. going to start next week again. Then we're going to go back into winter. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. It's kind of chilly here in um, Western North Carolina. Yeah. Um, what's been new? What's been going on? Uh, let's see. Practice has been interesting and enlightening, basically seeing just bigger patterns of how things fit together. Um, I think I talked last week, last time we met about uh, shock in the body. Mm -hmm. And the shock, for whatever reason, uh, of course, it, it's not it's not a far stretch to recognize that shock goes to the whole body, but mm -hmm. shock um, is part of the feet as well. It shows up in the feet for me. So one of the things shows up as the heel, the back part of the foot, uh, yes. not being able to move up and down. Another part shows up as the midfoot, the part that's in front of the, the leg bone, right at the ankle, not being able to move up and down. Okay. And uh, I've recognized that, in this week, I've been going into it, and it's literally from walking um, in shoes that don't work with my feet correctly. Mm -hmm. It'll put me in shock. And then my whole body locks up, and I feel stiff and old and, you know, get treated, and all of a sudden I feel young again. So yeah. that's been – it's been this interesting thing of me recognizing, huh, I wonder if this is all people, no matter what their age, when they mm -hmm. wake up and they feel stiff or, you know, at the end of the day they feel stiff – if it isn't coming from the feet. Okay. So I'm trying to wrap my head around it and gather more information. Okay. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's interesting. Uh, just some feedback from some of my clients, um, sure. the primitive retained reflexes. I've shared yep. that with my group coaching program. Yeah. And I have um, clients that are actually treating themselves they're working with the bottoms of their feet oh, releasing awesome. releasing the um the reflexes yep. that are held in the feet and they're saying it's shifting things all the way up yeah. and yeah. and they're sure. they're it's interesting they're seeing how it like ebbs and flows into their body uh, throughout the day throughout the week that mm -hmm. it'll present themselves and then it'll disappear so Anyhow, yeah, yeah. The, client, I got clients running with it. Did we talk about fear paralysis reflex? Yes, that was one of them. Okay, okay. So the thing is that I notice uh, you you seem like a psychic when you walk in, and so the the patient with a retained fear paralysis reflex, their body to me doesn't move smoothly. It's mm -hmm. jerky in its motions. Mm -hmm. And if you walk in as an adult, the fear paralysis reflex means fear, whatever you're scared of, when you turn up the volume, it causes paralysis in your body. Uh -huh. You basically forget how to speak and forget how to move. And so, and it's temporary. As soon as the volume turns back down, you're back in control of your faculties again. Mm -hmm. But it's neat to be able to tell these people how they function in a heated argument, mm -hmm. like you've known them for years. Huh. Interesting. I already immediately started thinking of several people that I know. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, if it's, a, if it's a discussion, they stay uh -huh. engaged. But right. the moment for them that it triggers their nervous system, they uh -huh. start to regress – back toward being more of an infant. Uh -huh. So they at the beginning, they lose vocabulary. Mm -hmm. You go from having college education to having grade school education. And you right. turn it up more, and you go back to having first grade education or kindergarten education. And you turn uh -huh. it up more, and you go back to not even be able to coo. And, and is this... Is this um something that you can evoke in the person, or this is just something that ha you're talking about an experience that they have based on a level of what's going on in their body. 
So, yes, I could invoke it. It becomes at some point unethical, though. Yeah, I didn't, I you would, recognize that it's there, and right. you can ask them questions about it, uh -huh. and that doesn't seem to trigger their nervous system. They can reflect on it and go, oh, yeah, that pattern's in my body. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to know them well enough to know their triggers to be able to push them, mm -hmm. right? But it's the pattern that I see in the practice. And mm -hmm. then when you start working with that fear paralysis reflex, the pattern in that patient begins to change. Uh -huh. And they can get um, aggravated and they stay more in control of their faculties uh -huh. to where if you're fully integrated, um, like I should be able to pull all your skeletons out of the closet, hang them in front of your eyes, razz you about them, and you look at me and go, oh, you know what, you're a little loony and I'm not biting. Mm -hmm. that's when you're fully in, engaged and your um, the fear paralysis reflex is in the background. If it's mm -hmm. not in the background, then you want to engage and rebuff everything that I said and, you know, make yourself look better. Mm -hmm. God, it's good to know. Yeah. That might be valuable in certain situations and scenarios, like let's say court. Uh, yes. Yes. Cool. Absolutely. Okay, we'll, we'll have to have a discussion offline about that. <laughs> yes, indeed. I uh, remember having an audio book on parasites mm -hmm. and literally how parasites take over the organism that they're in. And it was just this fabulous book. And it literally talked about people on a witness stand that with a certain parasite would react in a certain way. And they had done studies on it. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. That's cool. I like yeah. it. Yep. Uh, okay. We got a theme going on over here. Not okay. Not necessarily specific questions, but it's more of um, a theme of working with various clients. Um, okay. And, and it's very disjointed other than okay. it evolve it, it revolves all around teeth, okay. TMJ, jaw pain, tooth pain, that kind of stuff. And yes. understanding this disconnect uh, when going to the average dentist, okay. even, even more than the average dentist, biological dentists don't even know yep. or understand. So... Yes trying to understand the mechanisms of what causes um well i understand what the mechanisms that cause pain but in terms of bone loss and teeth cavities and not it's all kind of starting to get jumbled together for me and okay. would, would like to start a discussion this may be multiple weeks in terms Absolutely. of the rest TMG yep. and maybe next week we can get into more diagrams and things like that, but sure. start the discussion. Okay. So first of all, let's define our terms. Okay. So yes. In the realm of, let's say below the nose and above the chin. Okay. So that's mouth, lips, everything from the outside all the way through the head. Okay. We have a few different specialties who have an area that they're good in and then areas that they are completely blind in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a dermatologist would focus on the skin, for example, mm -hmm. and ear, nose and throat doctor is not going to do teeth, but would do anything other than teeth. And mm -hmm. they may also do surgery. So for example, if you, um, if you had a, a mole that needed to be removed, that would be a dermatologist. If you poke a pencil through your cheek and it's sitting inside your mouth, that falls under ear, nose, and throat or a surgeon. Not really a dentist. They don't do that. Mm -hmm. If you poke same pencil through and you chip a tooth, then you've got two different specialists. Mm -hmm. And so when we're thinking about that, we have to be clear about what we're defining and what specialty it would fall under. 
And then does that specialty know enough in general, not just their specifics, but in general to be able to help you? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we talk about, and you, TMJ, correct? Yes. So we start with anatomy. Temporo, temporal bones, those are the ones where your ears are. Yep. Mandibular joint. Okay. So it's the temporal bone and the joint where it joins the mandible, the jaw. Sits up here. That's me. Okay. Um, and so where that temporal mandibular joint is, there are three bones that make it up. The two temporal bones One and the mandible. Bone. Yeah, you want to bring up... Uh, TM, I, J, I'll bring up an uh, image here so we can sure. have a... Sounds great. Images. Share. Share screen. Go. TMJ. Okay. Let's uh, see here. Um, how about the second one with the, the kind of orange square? That one. That's perfect. Okay. Okay, let me see if I can make it a little bigger. Hey. Hey, look at that. That's perfect. Okay. Yeah. So, mandible's down at the bottom, right? That's our jaw. Uh -huh. Temporal bone is where it connects. So, that's up there. And it's a bone. Now, a dentist learns in dental school that the bones of the skull are fused together. Yes. And so basically you can do anything you want and you're not going to cause a problem. Right. Well, that's not reality because nearly anyone that dies, we could give their skull to the flesh eating beetles. So it comes back looking as bones, just like you see in the picture mm -hmm. and put beans or rice on the inside, stick the whole thing underwater and it breaks apart at the sutures. Mm hmm. So if the sutures were to fuse completely, which is what the dentists learn, that breaking apart of the sutures wouldn't happen, no matter what your age. These sutures, and, and just for those that may not be familiar, these are the sutures along yes. these. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So the bones move. Now, not much, but a little bit. Mm -hmm. So then when you look at the mandible, the mandible is a U shape. If we're looking at you from the front, it's a U. Right. Okay. And then that attaches to the temporal bones. Mm -hmm. And so we have hinges on both sides. Okay. Well, if one of those temporal bones moves in a different way than the other, okay. instead of being lined up across from each other, mirror images, we've got one that's moving one way on one side and one that's moving the opposite way on the opposite side. Mm -hmm. That, by definition, moves the mandible. You took mm -hmm. the hinges in space and you did this or you did that because mm -hmm. the bones move that can give you temporal mandibular joint pain mm -hmm. that doesn't come from the mandible. The mandible's fine. Nothing's happened to it. Right. The temporal bones have moved uh -huh. and that falls outside of the dentist realm. Oh, got it. it. It is outside of the ear, nose and throat doctor's realm because they don't study that. Uh huh. And so now you're in the realm of the sacro-occipital technique trained chiropractor, the cranial osteopath, the cranial sacral therapist, or anybody else who really has studied the way the bones of the head move. Okay. And so those are the folks that start to get those temporal bones correct. Mm -hmm. Now, once they get the temporal bones correct, if there's a problem with the teeth, got to get mm -hmm. the dentist involved. Mm -hmm. But in the scenario that we just defined, the dentist would be the second person, not the first. Right. Okay. So different scenario, same picture, different scenario. Let's say the temporal bones are correct in their location. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the this right here. Yep, exactly. So they're symmetrical across from one another. Right. And you get in a bar fight. Okay. In the bar mm -hmm. fight. You get hit in the jaw. Yep. Your favorite thing, pool cue, fist, beer bottle, doesn't matter. Something, though, literally distorts the shape of the mandible. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So it's living bone. It's the strongest bone in the body, but it can still compress and move. Mm -hmm. Whose jurisdiction does it fall under? Uh, so, if you get hit in the jaw. Hit in the jaw, right? The teeth are still okay. So then you have to ask yourself, is it dermatology? You're going to no. have a bruise. No, not dermatology. Is it ear, nose, and throat? Nope. Can't see what just happened on an x-ray, CT, or MRI if it is not broken. Uh-huh. Okay. Is it dentist? No, your teeth are fine. They might be in pain, but they're fine. It's not dentist. Again, it goes back to osteopath, chiropractor, craniosacral <laughs> therapist to get that strain out. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, same bar fight, <clears throat> and you your jaw took the same blow, and you broke a tooth. This is what typically happens. It falls under the dental realm, but the dentist is only trained to do part of what you need. Take care of the teeth. Yeah. Take care of the teeth. Exactly. They're going to do what they were taught perfectly. Mm -hmm. And then they don't know why you still have pain or why things don't work correctly. Right. Again, what we're describing, the, the trauma to the jaw falls outside of their purview. Right. Okay. So that's why I say when we're talking about all this, it's almost like you need a quarterback who can mm -hmm. see the big picture and say, here's the person you need to see first, let them do their job and do a wonderful thing. Then we're going to come back, make sure everything's right. We're going to send you the second person. They do their job. Mm -hmm. And it might take three or four or five people before you get everything put back together correctly. Right. And all of your symptoms go away. Right. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, what tends to happen is you can get someone, um, and we won't pick on the dentist, but we'll take a dentist, for example, who their heart's really in their work. They want to do good for their patients, but they don't know that they don't have the training they need to see the bigger picture. Yep. So they do what they're trained in, and some people get well, and some people don't. And the people that don't get well, they don't know why. And they don't know how to fix them because their training doesn't include what that person needed. Right. Right. Doesn't make anybody wrong. It's just that we have to understand that all of us, no matter who we are, have the things that we know and the things that we don't know. Mm -hmm. And the problem is we don't know the things that we don't know. <laughs> right. That was the um, conversation I had with a dentist earlier this week. Yeah. Yeah. Like I had um, asked him about the axiomatic pump that you had talked. You had Axoplasmic. Axoplasmic pump. Yes. Axoplasmic. And um, he said, yeah, I, I heard about that briefly. <laughs> and, uh, but, but it was interesting because they had, he had, um, he took an x-ray but he also had this three dimensional machine that yep. does a, like a CT scan of the head right, right. Uh, of the jaw and did that. And it was interesting because two years ago, went to a dentist, biological dentist, the biological dentist didn't have the three dimensional yes. thing. He said, I had several cavities. Be, then the whole COVID thing hit. So I put all of that on the, sure. the back burner and started doing some stuff myself. I go to this other dentist. He does this CT scan thing. He says, I have no cavities. It's all because of clenching TMJ stuff. Sure. That is going on. Why I'm having the issues with uh, bone loss and wearing of the teeth and things yep. like <clears throat> So I'm going got it. Uh, I need to do more research because we're looking at jaw pain. And this led to several other conversations with clients that I work with um, and through questions that came in with the Camella Foundation around the jaw. So I was like, well, this would be a great opportunity to really dig into that with exactly what you're saying is that you have these different jurisdictions, shall we say, with the, yep. with the, with the jaw. How do we begin to weave it all together? 
exactly to, to understand because if we can have bone loss why couldn't we have bone growth correct now so, one of my um dentist friends uh who at least when i knew him was in new zealand okay. <clears throat> he said what you can have with teeth um, in a perfect world, when you occlude, when your teeth come together, mm -hmm. everything fits and nothing moves a ton. Okay. But what you can have is in some people, when they occlude, you get one or more teeth that get forces put on them. And they're relatively large port forces in relationship to the periodontal ligament. And then that tooth will begin to move, okay? Let's just say it does this every time you bite down. Mm -hmm. It's called post-holing. So it's like taking a post that's in a hole and wiggling it back and forth until basically you can lift the post out of the hole. Right. Same thing happens with the tooth. And so what you get at the very beginning is a little bit of loosening of the ligament. Mm -hmm. Then you begin to get gum recession around that tooth. The body's mm -hmm. basically going, hey, look, it's going to fall out. I'm going to make it easier, okay? Mm -hmm. And at any point along the way, if you can stabilize the tooth, the body will heal itself. But you have to be able to figure that out and stabilize the bite. Right. So that's how you get your bone lost. Your bone gets reabsorbed because of the forces placed upon it. If you then stop those forces go back to where the tooth barely moves, you'll get the bone to regrow around the tooth, the gum to regrow, and theoretically, without the need for a periodontist and having surgery, mm -hmm. right? Just because you stop the movement of the teeth. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, gosh. There were two concepts that this dentist was talking about one was the pressure on the yep. teeth the other was the bacteria in the mouth so you have the ph level that's going on in the mouth that yep. if the ph level is too low because of the bacteria that um contributes to bone degeneration and gum loss is that is that correct am i Mm -hmm. I guess split hairs. So, okay. um, tooth, tooth technically is not bone. Okay. Okay. Te technically, tooth is tooth, bone is bone. Got it. And tooth is harder. So, okay. when you put somebody through a crematorium, the teeth tend to survive, the bones go away. Uh huh. So when the tooth sits in the socket, the bone, whether we're talking about the upper bone, the maxilla, or the lower bone, the mandible, ligaments hold that tooth in place. Then okay. it has a uh, gum over it. Okay. Mm -hmm. The gum doesn't firmly attach to the tooth. Mm-hmm. Okay. It kind of so covers over the top. Doesn't yeah, it? there's a tiny gap. Okay. It's not very big. That tiny gap is aerobic, right? When you open your mouth, air comes in. So basically, for all intents and purposes, you can't have anaerobic bacteria in your mouth in any place that's exposed to air. Okay. Okay. I can shove something down so far into the gum that it doesn't get exposed to air, and then it could become anaerobic. Okay. But all the tissue that we have in a healthy mouth is aerobic. Okay. So okay. that means that we only have bacteria that can survive exposed to air. Okay. Okay. Now, so that being our criteria for bacteria, we have some that love to grow in the mouth. Uh -huh. It just happens to be their optimal environment. Uh -huh. And all bacteria have temperature ranges <clears throat> that they can grow in, pH ranges that they can grow in, salt ranges that they can grow in, and uh -huh. any 
parameter that you pick, you're going to find some bacteria can thrive in that and it will kill others. Okay. So talk about pH. Okay. Okay. So now we're just dealing with either acid or base. Uh -huh. Your mouth is going to have your normal range, which is going to be slightly different than mine, but it's going to fall under a window of what we consider normal. Mm -hmm. If you then take in food items or beverages, which significantly shift that pH, mm -hmm. I've taken the normal bacteria and I've begun to make the soil that they grow in, in this case, the mouth, uninhabitable for them. They love different conditions. Mm -hmm. And so as we change the soil, we get different bacteria. Correct. Okay. So those different bacteria then do different things. Mm -hmm. They may produce more acid, which can then work its way through the enamel of your teeth. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they may produce um, fumes, basically, as they digest whatever they're eating, that give you what we would call bad breath, halitosis. Right. Okay. And all of this is because the conditions inside the mouth have changed just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the things that can change it are ultimately processed high sugar foods. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you, you, you eat a bag full of cookies every night or, a, you know, ice cream by the pint, quart, gallon, whatever it is. That sugar over time changes the conditions in the mouth, which can then lead to a shift in bacteria. The bacteria then do dastardly things to the teeth, and you mm -hmm. wind up with cavities. You wind up with cavities? You say? Cavities, yes, yes. Okay. okay. Um, gosh, I'm, I'm trying to understand how to ask the questions because it, it changes as you bring this depth of yep. knowledge to the conversation, ultimately we're what what when we're looking that then it's actually not bone loss that the dent bone loss that the dentist was talking about. It's tooth loss, which is enamel. Or so if we're just sticking with cavities, then what you'll get is the bacteria eat through the enamel. Okay. If the enamel can't be replaced, and it can repair itself, but if it can't be replaced, you have cavity. <clears throat> In theory, the dentist would like to take care of that cavity before it goes to the pulp and the nerve. Mm -hmm. Because those nerves don't like air on them, and that's why if you have a really bad cavity, every time you breathe, it's painful. Mm -hmm. Okay. The bone loss can occur because the tooth wiggles. Because okay. literally it moves, it post holes. Mm -hmm. And then a tooth, it's interesting, they're always dynamic. They're always able to shift their place in the mouth, even if it's only a tiny bit. Right. So teeth can extrude. So think about vampire fangs. They go from normal teeth, they grow, they become more pointed. The teeth grow out of the plane of the rest of the teeth. That's called extrusion. Okay. They can also intrude. They can go below the plane that you bite on. Mm -hmm. And um, for example, if you took, uh, I don't know, let's just say cotton roll, and you put cotton roll on one side, like that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. eventually the teeth that it touch are going to grow into the, the jaw more. They're going to get, they're, they're, the teeth are going to stay the same size. They're going to move into the jaw. To make okay. room for the cotton roll. Got it. Okay. So if I wanted to do something like that, I can take a, a small force and change the way the teeth come together. Okay. If I remove that force, let's just say I had a tooth pulled. Uh -huh. The tooth on the other side of the mouth, right? So let's just say I've got a pulled tooth on the top. Uh -huh. The tooth on the bottom that now has no neighbor to push it into place will start uh -huh. to grow up to fill that gap. Oh, okay. It's interesting how that, how it works. Yeah. Okay. Maybe get more pointed. How can we begin to regrow the enamel on teeth? 
how can uh, I mean okay uh, increasing the pH increasing the pH of the mouth um, is going to play a role how I'm so, understanding well uh, let me say optimizing optimizing the pH optimizing the right because we want wherever you are to come back to normal okay so first thing is and this is from reading a ton of dental books most tooth pastes that come out as a paste or a gel have glycerin in their formulation. Okay. Now, if I remember correctly, it was 23 rinsings of the mouth before the glycerin coat comes off the teeth and the teeth can then begin to re-enamelize. So, wait a minute. Are you saying the glycerin and toothpaste actually prevents the enamel from? Did you just did you just commit I, heresy I, I, here? Charlie? Probably so. Yes. <laughs> I'll be looking for the big black van to pull up in my driveway at any moment yeah. and take me away. They're they're using helicopters nowadays, possibly okay. even drones. Anyways, okay. go ahead. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Then the white in toothpaste. Okay, and whatever brand you pick, the white is usually bauxite. Now, yeah. bauxite is a mineral that they put in a smelter and make aluminum out of. Is that the aluminum smelting, the, the um, fluoride? Yeah, exactly. Same thing that fluoride comes from. Okay. So you're okay. talking about conventional toothpaste as opposed right. conventional to... Conventional toothpaste. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So there are things in there, um, sodium lauryl sulfate, sodium laureth sulfate, that basically mm -hmm. are, uh, that make it suds so that you mm -hmm. feel that, you know, they call it a good tooth feel, right? Yes. So it feels like it's doing something. And those aren't necessarily good for you either. Okay. So if we start with, hey, I need a toothpaste that's going to help my teeth to heal, Mm -hmm. What I recommend to folks is one of two things. You either mm -hmm. make your own. Baking soda, salt, um, some essential oils for a flavor. And you can make your own and there are recipes on the internet. No big deal. Mm -hmm. Or you can choose a tooth powder. Tooth powders, the great thing is you travel with them, no problems. You don't have to take them out of your bag. Mm-hmm. So it, it doesn't fit that criteria for the uh, TSA of something that they need to look at. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you, could, so. you could fit them behind your, behind your mask. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose technically you could. <laughs> um, but I have found that tooth powders are a game changer. Okay. So you don't have the glycerin. You don't have the bauxite. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, fluoride's personal opinion, there are lots of studies that prove that it is a bad thing, but that's a discussion for a different time. Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, it's... But, it... Tooth powders. Okay. Diet change. And if you want to get technical and scientific about it, Litmus paper is what they use to test pH. Um, the world's largest supplier online has it. You can get it at the health food store. And what you can do is you can test your salivary pH. Basically, you take a little is there a, Is there a range that we're wanting to shoot for? For the... It's the... If you look up... Um, salivary pH levels again on you know your favorite search engine. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, it'll tell you something. Okay, so um, you want to be within the range. Theoretically, you'd like to be almost at the center of that range. Okay, got okay. it. And then um, you need to get the the litmus paper, the pH paper that will tell you that pH range. Hold on a second. 
Let me uh, let me see what I can. We got salivary pH levels. Look at that. Hold on one moment. One moment, please. Let me see what we got here. That was a really <coughs> study. It seems to be saying saliva pH of 7.0 usually indicates a healthy dental and periodontal situation. Okay. This is, I will put the, um, this is a study from the NIH. Perfect. And I will put that in the show notes. Okay. Of this. <clears throat> so a pH of seven, right? Which is balanced. Okay. Not acidic, not basic. Yep. So you put your litmus paper in your mouth, right? It's the diet that you've been having. No big deal. It's going to come out some number. If it comes out seven, whatever you're doing is good. Mm -hmm. If it comes out different, if it comes out six or eight, you mm -hmm. know, you can improve. Got it. And so then what you do is you change your diet. Okay. A week later, you test your mouth again. See if you're moving in the right direction. Got it. Okay. Well, so, that. I mean, that's pretty simple. <clears throat> okay. Well, that'll that'll be helpful as far as um, I think getting around the concept of teeth and cavities. Now, question for you. Okay. Um, and there's so many variables in this; it's difficult to actually zero in because I had the biological dentist two years ago. That said, sure. you got cavities, Bill. You need to, you need to address that now. Did he indicate it was a cavity because um, one, he was seeing it on an X-ray? Did uh, were those cavities real? Uh, were were they a potential bottom line revenue booster? I, I you know, I mean, uh, I'm not going to rule it out as a possibility. Correct. Were they um, were they not as accurate because the biological dentist just had an X-ray and this other dentist had the three-dimensional CT scan and had a better view of what those sure. things could have possibly looked like a um, cat. So, in the dental world, there is an axiom: drill, mm -hmm. fill, and bill. Okay, great. And some, for some dentists, that is their practice. Okay. So if they feel like they can get away with charging you money to fill a very, very tiny cavity, which mm -hmm. costs the same as filling a bigger cavity, they'll do that. I'm not saying it's ethical, moral, or legal, but they do it. Sure. Yeah. And who's another dentist who will look at it and say, ah, you know what? It's likely to fix itself. We'll watch it for a while. So that leads into my other question. Okay. I continue to tweak and adjust things sure. in my diet and different things like that. Not necessarily saying that I always eat perfectly. Sure. You know, I, I enjoy sugar. Yep. My own baking. So is it, can, is it the possibility that a cavity – that existed two years ago, fixed itself as a result of dietary adjustments. And Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. Then to what degree, because I, I have this belief that the body has the capacity to heal itself. Sure. And then there's some limitations, uh, like when I tore the ACL in, in my knee, yeah. and I had yeah. torn meniscus. <clears throat> I opted for surgery. Yep. And I I believe that helped me along my healing path. But I've also had clients that I've worked with over the past 20 years who was like, I, I lived on the East Coast. I had my ACL torn. I went to a doctor. They did a MRI, confirmed it was torn. 
I didn't have time to deal with it. I moved all the way across the country. I was living on the West Coast. This was several years later. I got the MRI again of what's going on in my knee and the ACL reattached. Yep. So. The body's an amazing thing. Yeah. So that it's kind of a interesting thing. So to what degree in going back to the teeth, um, the clenching of the teeth, the wearing of the teeth, uh, cavities, how, what could we begin doing? I've obviously changed the, the tooth powder. We're removing okay. the things that are preventing the tooth re enamel from being reestablished. Yep. Uh, or making our own toothpaste. We could change our diet. Are there other things we can do that can actually build, build the tooth? Mm. Uh, what you drink. So water versus soda, for example, water is a better choice. Mm -hmm. Anything with no sugar in it. Um, you can do so toothpaste if we just stick with that toothpaste pulls off water soluble stuff mm -hmm. okay you can also oil pull so you can take something like coconut oil you swirl it around in your mouth for 20 minutes and then spit it out and oil is basically a solvent for the oil soluble things that are in your mouth mm -hmm. So you can do what's called oil pulling. Okay. Uh, I mean, it, it, depending on how far down the rabbit hole you want to go, there are many things that you could add in there. You mm -hmm. could look at what's in teeth, like what their chemical makeup is, and make sure mm -hmm. that those chemicals are in your diet so that your body can build teeth. And again, that's more that's another hour of discussion, but you basically look up the pathway. So if you're going to make uh, enamel, what components are in enamel? How do they fit into the pathways in the body? What mm -hmm. other things do you need to make sure those pathways work? And then you go from there. Okay. So um, is the entire tooth made up of enamel or just has an enamel coating? Enamel coating. <clears throat> and what is on the inside? Is that bone or is that? Pulp. Pulp. Okay. Yep. Not to be confused with wood pulp, but Got it. it's similar. Okay. Um, let's let's kind of put a bow on today because we went pretty okay. deep on a lot of different things. Um, there, there's some stuff. I think this is this is a, a great great discussion. Um. I'm going to digest it, probably watch this again. Okay. And then uh, if you have some ideas that we can have, continue the conversation around TMJ, tooth pain, uh, jaw pain, things like that. Um, sure. That is, uh, yeah, this is fascinating. I could see this going on for several weeks, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> totally fine. Yeah. Cool. Um, anything else? You want to? That's it, brother. All good. Yeah, D this was good stuff. Um, thank you much. Uh, it uh, puts a lot of. You really tie some things together, especially with the concept of the ear, nose, and throat dentist and um, uh, skin dermatology. Doctor. Yep, dermatologist. Yeah, that was that was interesting. Okay. Well, thank you much. We will um, reconvene next Wednesday, 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, appreciate you all very much. If you have questions for Dr. Beck, please go to – oh, we didn't do any of the promo stuff. We got to do that. We got to remember that more. There we go. You can go to AskDrBeck.com. All of that's going to be in the show notes down below. I will put the link to that study that we were referring to regarding the um, saliva in the mouth or the pH of the mouth, we'll include that, and we will go further down the rabbit hole of tooth pain, jaw pain, all that kind of stuff next week. So this is Bill Paravano, the knee pain guru. Thank you so much for being here. For Ask Dr. Beck, Charlie, thank you so much.
Thank you, Bill. And, uh, we'll see you next week. Sounds good. Take care, everyone. Have a good week. Okay. Bye-bye.